and support begins in three, two, one. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Nurture and Support. I am Mel at Karmic9. Hi, everybody. This is Kelly at K-E-L-L-Y-T-H-U-L on Twitter and Instagram. And we're back for another thrilling episode of Nurture and Support, or in Mel's world, what she's bought on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> we're back to that, huh? We are. So what I've bought recently, which I have i haven't told you all about it yet because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a dud. I've talked about my various caffeine addictions in the past. So I've bought a new contraption <laughs> to help me facilitate my caffeine addiction. I bought a new water kettle, a new electric water kettle. I think I've talked probably about all my electric water kettles on this show before. Oh, uh, so French presses, yes. The AeroPress, definitely, I talked yep. about. Yeah. So this is just a contraption that boils the water that you pour into those other caffeine-producing contraptions. It's a very important part of the process and how you boil water. I don't actually like nuking water in the microwave. I think it gives it a, the water a flat taste. Don't know. Y'all can disagree with me, but I like to boil my water in a glass kettle and who has time to do it actually on the stove where also Mel is likely to hurt herself. So I've been through a number of electric water kettles and these vary from just a kettle that you only boils water that you plug into the wall and it boils water shuts off and there you go. I've had that kind. I've had the old plastic ones that probably are going to give me cancer someday. I used that one for a couple of years until they said, oh, BPA is bad. Yeah. Oh, but, the, but Amazon Amazon didn't sell those because we want to no. stay on Amazon's good side. No, I'm pretty sure I bought that at a box store here. There you go. So I've then been through a couple of plain water ones and all of the ones I've had, they've had varying features that I've liked, but they all essentially just boil water. They've moved up to now where you have the glass carafe that sits on the little induction plate. And that's how it does it. It's how it heats the water instead of you actually, you know, having this big heavy thing that can't be washed that you have to descale and do all of that not fun stuff with. So I, I think I talked about an old one that I had bought, or maybe I just talked about it on Twitter several years ago, which was a Hamilton Beach one that had a LED light inside that I was totally tickled by and posted pictures <laughs> everywhere of because in a dark room when it was boiling water, it was all lit up blue and it was pretty. So that is the only downside to the kettle I'm going to talk about today is that it doesn't have a light inside of it. And I've been trying to think about how I could rig it to have a light inside of it but well you can we, we can go back to a previous nurture and support recommendation from dr mike with his that's led right. pucks and you just that's stick right. one of those down in a pot yeah or, or i could put it behind it maybe and then yeah, that have might it be just shine through <laughs> that that could work i'll have to i'll have to work on that so the kettle that i've gotten is a little bit pricey so don't judge me too much but i've talked about my tea that I like before too. Now, I don't know if I've really talked to y'all about tea and coffee being best brewed at particular temperatures. I've really not put, I'm a bad, I'm a bad aficionado here. I've not put a whole lot of real high quality temperature adjustment into the temperature that I brew my tea at. I know I've talked about in the past how I'm mostly a green tea and an oolong tea drinker. Those are my two main teas. I'm not big into black tea, but so coffee in my co in my French press and oolong and green teas are my big things. All of those substances brew best at a different temperature. These high-priced kettles, you set the temperature and it just heats the water to that temperature so that it's at the exact temperature that you need, which is cool and is faster than me trying to do it myself. So this kettle, the brand name, I'm going to tell you of the one I've bought, but I like this kettle. I've been using it for over a month. I have had zero problems with it. It actually has really good reviews. It's technically called, the brand is AI Cook, all one word. So AI and then C-O-O-K. It's an electric tea kettle, 1.7 liter. 
they make a couple of different models. This is the one I have is the middle model. So like I said, it's a little pricey for a kettle. If you don't want something that boils at a specific temperature, it runs about $50. They actually have one that's about, oh, 10 or $15 more than this one, which is their Primo version. And you can adjust the temperature with a little dial. So you can really dial in to get it at a specific temperature that you want. That one was never in stock when I decided that I was gonna click a button and I was gonna get me a new kettle. So I ended up getting this one that was in stock and I'm happy with it. But I think the higher end one being the little bit of a price difference is perfectly good too if you really wanna jump all in and get both of them. So this kettle. What is so awesome about it? It's pretty, it's silver. It has the it has a cool lid. So what it lacks in not lighting up, pretty blue color, it makes up for in the way the lid is formed. It actually has a two-part lid with a little twist cap that you take off and it has a hole in the middle. This is hard to visualize y'all, but the cap has a center part that comes out and that's where you would put your tea infuser. So the tea infuser is this long silver mesh cylinder that you fit down inside. You put your loose leaf tea in there. And after you've gotten your water to temperature, you put that in there and let your tea brew in the kettle. If that's, if you want to make a whole pot of tea, that's the easy way to do it. It's neat that the, that the infuser fits in the middle like that. And then the cap can go over it to help everything steam and infuse well. Most of them have ones that you have to take the lid off and either use your own little silicone infuser or a tea ball or something like that and just chunk it in there and then you're going to burn yourself trying to fish it out, all of that kind of stuff. This fits in nicely. And if you're not going to use it for that, the whole lid comes off as one big piece and gives you full access to be able to clean the inside of the kettle out. So all of this is terribly sexy. I know everybody really is really into cleaning their kettles, but it's important when you use a kettle every day that you have to clean the lime scale and stuff out of it. So you have to be able to reach in there. So these kettles have attached lids that prevent you from easily cleaning them. That this is an important feature, y'all. Trust me, I've been through many, many kettles. You need a lid that comes completely off. And this one comes off in two plate, two pieces. So you can just take the center part off and fill it with water and put that back on. If you're only going to use it to boil water, which honestly is mostly what I use mine for. So that's just the water part of it. The kettle sits on a little induction base. So it's got the center plate that actually inducts the heat up into the kettle to boil the water. Nothing gets hot except for the water in the kettle and the glass if you're going to touch it, which I don't recommend because you'll burn yourself. But on the base are five little buttons. Let me see. How many buttons are there? I lost my thing. Just a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven buttons. So you have settings for everything. You have a temperature, a specific temperature setting for green tea, one for white tea, one for oolong tea, one for coffee, and then one for boiling, just boil straight up boiling water, or that is your black tea setting or your herbal tea setting. And then there's a power button. And there is a keep warm feature. So if you're going to brew your tea actually in the pot, you can keep it warm for 120 minutes automatically. So kind of like in the automatic coffee maker that everyone is used to, this will keep your tea warm. For a certain amount of time. The reason I went with this model is because most of these that I found in my research beep really loudly. They make a lot of noise to make sure that you know there is power going to it and it's keeping stuff warm. I saw people complain that it was a really loud beep and they couldn't get it to stop. This one has a very, very soft little beep when it's finished getting your water to temperature. And then the keep warm feature, you can mute it for telling you with the reminder that it's keeping the kettle warm, which is a good feature if you're making tea like me, if you're boiling water either really early in the morning because you're going to work or really late at night because you've stayed up too late watching The Witcher and you needed some tea. 
and you didn't want to wake up the rest of the house boiling your tea kettle. So this is one of those, you know, life goals things. Everybody, if you're a tea drinker, you actually need this. I have not thought that I really needed this for a really long time, but in talking to a friend who has one of the really expensive tea makers now, we're talking like over $200 tea makers that basically do the same thing, only it will automatically lower the basket with the tea in it into the water. You can set it and program it like a coffee maker. She has one of these and I've been very jealous of it for a while. And then she told me, well, it, that part of it wasn't working anymore. So she was having to do it manually. And I was like, yes, now I can go buy my $50 tea kettle that's going to do the same thing as her $200 tea kettle that's not working. So that was what actually probably prompted me clicking the button too, was like, ha ha, I'll show you. I only spend $50 for mine. You're a good friend, Mel. You're I, a good friend. <laughs> I am a good friend. I am a good friend because I haven't told her I only paid $50 for my damn tea kettle. There you go. And it does the same thing. So like I said, my temperature adjustment, I've never really bothered to really get a thermometer and check the temperature of my water in the past because my kettles just boiled the water. So I'd kind of go, it's boiled. I'm going to let it sit for a minute. That'll be sort of the right temperature. Pour it in there. I have to say boiling it at the right temperature and using it at the right temperature really, really has improved the flavor of some of the teas. It hasn't improved it on all of my teas but almost all of my teas, actually steeping them at the proper temperature has actually made them taste better. And I was really kind of surprised by that. And more surprising to me was the change in my coffee habit. So I've always just boiled the hell out of that water and poured it directly into my French press and let it you know, steep for a minute. You're supposed to do coffee at 200 degrees. I've seen some people get picky and say 198, but 200 is the accepted number I see. And uh, I buy coffee beans. I grind my beans myself. I guess I should have been pickier about my water temperature all these years. It did help <laughs> on these coffee beans that I've been, I've been buying the same, my regular cup of coffee that I have every day is from the same company, same roast. I've been, I'm very, I'm very steady in that way. I've been buying the same one forever, so I know how this roast tastes. And when I actually brewed it at the proper temperature, it did taste better. <laughs> so I was surprised. So I'll not bore y'all with more tea kettle talk, but clearly I could talk about this for a while. I won't. I'll shut up. <laughs> but, but I really, I'm shocked. I had to share with all of you that as long as I have been a crazy loose leaf tea person, and a, a weird ways of brewing coffee person for all of the years that we've been doing this show. I've never been real picky about the temperature I was brewing stuff at. And I should have been because I've, I've lost, you know, all of these years of enjoyment. Maybe I would be a happier person if I had been brewing my coffee and tea at the proper temperature all these years. I don't think that's true, but <laughs> it could have helped. It could have maybe. It could have helped. So the AI cook is the brand of the kettle that I got, the AI Cook Electric Tea Kettle. And it's a really cool little silver and glass tea kettle. I like the looks of it too, but it's cool. I like it. As far as some of these kettles go, they can be a lot more expensive than this and not and do basically the same job. The kettle I got, it has 559 ratings on Amazon with a, with a score of 4.7 out of 5 stars. So the upper model that I had talked about has 323 ratings with a 4.6 out of 5 stars. So that's pretty solid. And I've had mine for probably about six weeks. And my kettle gets used numerous times a day. And um, I've had zero problems with it. I was a little concerned that it wasn't going to be, you know, very good quality and was going to break pretty quickly, but it's worked really well. And I haven't had any staining of any of the glass or any of the silver surfaces on it, which when you're dealing with coffee and tea is something that happens. Most kettles start looking kind of grungy pretty quickly. I've had zero problems with this one. I really like the way the lid works. And uh, 
it's a purchase I'm happy that I made. And one of these days I will take it to, to my friend and go, look, <laughs> maybe I'll buy her one for Christmas and Good. go, ha. Because <laughs> you're a good friend. I am a <laughs> great friend. There you go. So, so that's awesome. The uh, on the infuser side, you could you could also let's say maybe you have a like a Death Star infuser or a rubber duck mm-hmm. infuser. Those will work too, right? Yeah, they'll. You can you could actually depending on the type, how it connects at the top. I wouldn't want to put something that's going to sink all the way to the bottom, but you should add your infuser after your kettle comes to temperature. Don't put your infuser in, then fill it with water and then turn it on to get to temperature because that it's not, you won't get a good infusion that way. You'll actually kind of scorch your tea. It's not good. But if you're using a different kind of infuser, it'll get the infuser really hot. So you get it up to temperature. You can take off the cute little middle lid on the top and put your infuser in. And if it's one that has kind of a hook on the end, you can just hook it on the top and it will hang there prettily in the middle of your kettle while it steeps your tea. Well, I believe yeah. the duck infuser we have does have the hook. So <laughs> good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, and, there, and there's a cute little Loch Ness one that has the neck of the Loch Ness makes a hook oh, at the top to hang nice. in there. There's all kinds of cute infusers. I actually mostly use a contraption called an ingenuity to actually brew my tea in. So I very rarely brew a whole pot of tea in this kettle. I brew it sort of by the cup or it might, might have a large ingenuity and it, it makes about two cups for me, but that's a whole nother contraption. I think I've also talked about at some point in this show because it's, it's pretty cool. Totally go brew your water at a specific temperature for the tea that you're going to drink and be amazed at actually the difference that it makes. And the, the difference it made in my coffee was just astounding to me. I, I didn't think that my coffee could get any better. I didn't think I could love coffee anymore than I did. But when I actually brewed it at the right temperature, I was like, hey, this is smoother. Yeah, I'm a more of grab it and drink it. <laughs> if it's How do you like your coffee? And I'm just like, hot. <laughs> you know, just that's about it. So I'm just a huge coffee fan, period. But you do tell when it's really good coffee, you notice it. Yeah, you got to work on the LED thing, though. You may have to go with back with those puck lights to kind of give the full yeah. experience there. Yeah, I'm going to have to do something cuz you know, I talked myself into I wouldn't miss it, but I do. <laughs> yeah. It must be a Hamilton Beach upstairs cuz it's got the nice blue LED which there, I like quite a bit too. Yeah, there's a lot of them that do and that actually that light is the reason that I moved up. I moved to that one cuz I want to say I think I was in Target and trolling the the housewares section as i do because i like kitchen gadgets and came across this kettle on clearance and was like it lights up mine at home doesn't light up it's perfectly good it works just fine it boils water but it doesn't light up i have to have this and it's it's clearance so you know it's a deal i'm doing them a favor by taking it off their hands because it lights up so i think i'm going to take it to work and use that one at work because it lights up and maybe that will make me happier. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just go, I'll just go in the break room and turn the lights off and turn my kettle off. (laughs) Just kind of stare at it. (laughs) Yeah. It beats, beats going outside to scream or going in the bathroom to cry. So I'll just go in the break room slash closet (laughs) and watch my little blue led light dance in the little bubbles. Sounds good. I think we'll continue on with that up note. Uh, and I'll move into my recommendation. So I love me some Amazon too. Always happy to, and we've talked about uh, a lot of my purchases on there as well. But as much as I love Amazon, I also love free open source software quite a bit. If we mentioned that before, OBS, yeah. I really prefer not to pay. And we've also talked about on previous shows that my graphic editor of choice is Paint Shop Pro which is an Eisenhower era steam powered piece of software that I think the last fully accredited version ran on windows 95. The version I have was Mm -hmm. like a windows 95 version that I have loaded on windows seven machines, windows 10 machines, and the registry doesn't really know what to do with it anymore, but it still works. 
And I know how to use it, and it's been the thing, and I've talked about GIMP, which is an open source, very much like Photoshop-based tool. And I said, i got to get into that and actually start to use something that's got a little more power. So I've been trying to force myself to go into GIMP more when I'm just doing simple cropping or these types of things to, to learn how. And I was really struggling when I was left to my own devices. I was making very, very slow progress. And then I came across what my recommendation for this week will be, which is a YouTube channel. It's a YouTube channel called Logos by Nick. And he provides a fair number of GIMP tutorials, many of them related around logo creation. And in fact, for Squat Cobbler, most of the graphical Squat Cobbler logos you've seen in the past are ones that have been created, either you've seen open source stuff or PaintShop Pro. And they're all right. They all use the brand consistent squealer font that not only Squat Cobbler uses, but was founded by Nurture and Support. Nurture and Support declared squealer as the official font of everything within the Bog Panda universe. And it's worked well. I had to download that font actually for GIMP. Uh, it didn't come preloaded. Who knew? Yeah. And uh, shocker. I've been kind of playing around. So the, I've, I've created the best looking Squat Cobbler logo we've had so far. It's kind of like an embossed leather Squat Cobbler now. Uh, so cool. contrast wise, it's a, a little challenging because it's black on black. But to, you know, once you get out of the thumbnail, it actually looks really good. I'll include it in the blog post. Our friend Jeans is toying with uh, resurrecting some podcast material at some point in time. And if she does, Skittles McGeek is her intended name for uh, her new content as she starts to do something again. So I've created a logo for her using GIMP as well. And I did all of these, the Squat Cobbler and Skittles McGeek. I'll include both of these in the blog post. But I learned how to do these by going to Logos by Nick and watching his tutorial video. He explains things incredibly well. My one major grumble with him is he calls it the blend tool. He says, now go to the blend tool and do this. And I spent 20 minutes looking for the <laughs> blend tool, searching on the web, and eventually found out the gradient yeah. tool is equal to the blend tool. Nick, my friend. Yeah, use <laughs> say, the right words for the right Say gradient program. tool because <laughs> it doesn't come up and say blend tool. It says gradient tool. That took me a little bit of frustration. But by watching his videos, and I'm still... I'm still only decent at it when I follow him step by step, say, do this, do that. I'm a little fuzzy on some of the things he's doing because there's different for each layer. And this has been my big shift out of PaintShop Pro. PaintShop Pro, I could do layers and all that, but I didn't really have to. You could kind of work on the flat image and, and do all that. But he, you know, within GIMP, you really want to work in layers and do all that. He does a fantastic job of explaining, okay, now create a new layer, duplicate this layer, change it from normal to overlay. And so exactly what those do, I don't know quite yet, except I really <laughs> like the effect. <laughs> and I go, oh, okay. So that's what I do. So I, I still have much learning to do, but Nick has helped me on my path that I'm now actually comfortable that if I had an image and I wanted to go in and do something, I think I can start with GIMP and I can kind of do it and I'm not going to get frustrated and learn how. So it's been very helpful for me to go in. The other thing that, so his channel has an entire playlist on GIMP tutorials, and they're really, really good. In addition, I don't have any direct experience with this yet, but it's going to be a download, perhaps even tonight. There's a tool called Inkscape that's also open source, and it's a vector-based tool. And so really, so do you know the difference between roster and vector-based uh, video editing tools, Mel? I know the words because I've, I've been through and failed at your struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I know the words, but no, I couldn't, I couldn't define them for anyone. I had a hard time <laughs> until very recently too, but Nick also has a very nice video out there called Inkscape versus GIMP, the complete comparison. And so Inkscape's vector-based and GIMP is roster-based. And super shorthand for it, roster-based is think about colored pixels, making up the picture. So if you're doing things that are include a photograph at any point in time, you're going to want to use a tool like, like GIMP. It's raster-based. If you're doing lo pure logo work and it's lines and sharp lines you want to do and kind of taking shapes to kind of create stuff, vector-based is probably a better way to go. And that's where Inkscape comes in. But he has a gazillion um, examples of all sorts of really cool effects and all of that. And 
I've been trying, I said, trying to force myself about once a day to go in and say, well, let me try one of his tutorials. So I'm working on a new nutrient support one. I haven't really decided exactly which tutorial I'm going to use to pull it off. And I actually might do it in Inkscape. I might get that down and kind of use one of his tutorials for that. But good production quality. I mean, it's, it's not flashy or anything. It's just it's basic. He shows uh, He shows what he's doing. He explains what he's doing. He comes back and, and kind of slows down. He almost gives you all the time. You do it this way, or you could do this keyboard shortcut, or if you're on a Mac, you could do this. So he's very good at making sure, with the exception of this whole gradient blender thing, yeah. <laughs> with the exception of that, he's fantastic at kind of really making it easy to kind of follow along, to get the ideas through there. And he, pleasant personality, explains things well and clearly doesn't assume you know everything, but when he explains stuff, it's not condescending in what he talks about. He's been a graphical artist for some time, uses open source stuff a lot. And his channel, if you're if you're playing with it, if you want to get better, if you're just trying to learn it, these are just fantastic. What I'll do is I'll just bring one of them up and get things set up. Just kind of spend a you know an hour or so playing the YouTube video, hitting pause, jumping over to GIMP, doing a little bit of that, and I'm learning. I'm slowly learning. And every once in a while, I miss a step or something like that. I go, Why is mine not working out? But I learn a little bit that way too. So yeah, I think he does a fantastic job. It's helped me a lot to kind of understand because I. I've seen roster a lot. I didn't really know how to describe it <laughs> until uh, his stuff, the distinction between vector and roster, I knew they, they were different, but he does a good job. At some point, we may be talking about GIMP and in- Inkscape here on Nerd Transport, but I have actually, I think I'm about ready to move away <laughs> from PaintShop <laughs> Pro. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I know. And it's the thing, I'm using a version. I don't know what the actual current version of PaintShop Pro is, but I've got to be like at least like seven versions behind there we go. I just got the one that was like set for windows 95 and I learned it and they had a clone brush and I, this way I could kind of take one person's head and put it over here yeah. and just the brush size and away I went, but there's just so much more power with GIMP. And if you know what you're doing and I'm slowly, I'm still an incredible novice, but Nick's helped me a lot. So I think he's doing a great job with his channel. He's got about 300,000 subscribers. So he's doing a decent wow. job there. It's good content and uh, a good variety of stuff and the inkscape stuff that i'm seeing looks like super good but you know that's i was you know <laughs> i was trying to get off page up for hope like well now i gotta learn another one but it seems like it's gonna be worth it because ultimately i think i probably do more logo work than photo work anyway mm-hmm. so that seems like i'm gonna probably need to get familiar with that and i'll pay the low low price of nothing for Inkscape as well. I want to say I think I've I've heard of Inkscape being used by a lot of young artists. They recommend it for, you know, young artists that are wanting to explore more digital art and get into that. I think that's where I've heard of it. Or maybe there's an app for it. Have you noticed if he does anything with like iPad apps like Procreate? Because Melissa has some Procreate and she has a Apple Pen, but she can't do anything because she can't draw, and I don't know how to use any of the apps. And so that's, I've watched many a tutorial trying to use the stuff I have, and it's like, I just suck. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I'm very, very familiar with that, that challenge. So my, my basic read of his channel, it's about 75% Inkscape, 25% GIMP. Uh, where I became aware of him and began to kind of use the stuff was the GIMP tutorials because I said they were incredibly helpful. I have not seen any Apple stuff yet. Yeah. You know, GIMP is basically Photoshop mm-hmm. and um, Inkscape is basically Illustrator. Yeah. Except, you know, multiple hundreds of dollars less. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And a lot of them, once you learn how to do stuff in one and you you learn the thought process behind what you're doing, it translates to other programs. At least that's what the tutorials have assured me. But again, (laughs) I don't remember what I learned from one day to the next. And so, yeah, I'm still struggling with that. So I'm glad that you're, you're out there giving it a go, moving away from the paint shop, bro. Well, since well before we started this podcast, it's been the only thing I've used. So it's time. <laughs> and so, so thanks to Nick for helping me get a little bit closer. And there is a ton of good stuff out there on GIMP from a variety of channels, but his is the one that broke through for me to at least 
yeah. start to get me more comfortable. And now I, I at least understand the basic operations of the thing that if I, cause I couldn't even initially crop a fo- I mean, I could mm-hmm. crop a photo in five seconds in paint shop pro. And if I brought it up in GIMP, it was like, I don't understand <laughs> what's going on. I've gone back to using paint sometimes instead of looking at GIMP because it comes up and I'm like, I have no idea what to do, but I know how to do it in paint. <laughs> so screw it. I'll just go open it and paint and crop it. Yep. Try it. Yeah, try one or two of his videos. Find something you think looks kind of cool to say, hey, let me try one of these. He's got one that you can put somebody's face on an orange. Oh. It's just kind of, kind of a fun thing to do. Get you familiar with the basic. Far from an expert now, but at least... Uh, I can, I've been trying to force myself to go into GIMP versus Paint Shop Pro, and Nick has helped me along that journey. So thank you, sir. And uh, that's my recommendation for this week. Cool. Well, so we've got a tea kettle and a YouTube channel that will help you perhaps draw your own tea kettle. There you go. With LED lights. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can even animate those puppies on that whole vector thing. Vectors, I think, move too. So. You could probably, yeah. More to come on that. Excellent. Okay. Well, like, thank everybody for listening. As a reminder, we're on iTunes, we're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher, we got a blog, we got a Twitter account we never look at, we got an email we never look at. We never look at, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, we try and put all of our uh, podcasts out also on the Bog Panda YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe there so you can get to that, the Squat Cobbler stuff, the uh, Solemn Battery stuff, and, and all those other things. So you can get us on YouTube. You can get us on a lot of other platforms. So whatever medium you choose, we would be greatly appreciative if you would join us and subscribe in whatever way you would like to. And just like say, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks. Bye. You can contact us on our website, nurtureandsupport.net. Or email us at nurtandsup at gmail.com. That's N-U-R-T-A-N-D-S-U-P-P at gmail.com. Or tweet us at nurtandsup on Twitter. You can also catch Nurture and Support on YouTube. Nurturing and supporting. Terminated.